Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining our Bringing Adults Back to Community College webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Geary. I'm a senior policy analyst at New America, and I'm the author of the Bringing Adults Back to Community College playbook that we published yesterday. Um, I'm going to get us started today by going over a presentation on our Bringing, it Up, uh, Bringing Adults Back to Community College project, as well as our major uh, research findings and recommendations. I'll then um, hand it over to Iris Palmer, who's the Deputy Director for Community Colleges at New America, who will be moderating um, a panel with experts in the field. Um, at the end of that panel discussion, there will be time uh, for Q&A. So again, please do uh, think of questions as they arise and, and submit them. Great, so to get us started, I really wanna contextualize uh, this conversation in terms of the broader uh, changes in, in higher education enrollment that we've seen since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this slide shows changes in college enrollment across all sectors of higher education from fall 2019, that's right before the pandemic, uh, to fall 2021. And what we see that is really clear is while enrollment declined across the board, we see particularly pronounced uh, enrollment declines um, in community colleges. But when we looked at enrollment of first time adult students, that is uh, students that are over the age of 25 that are enrolling in, in higher education for the first time, we actually see a more nuanced and I would argue a more troubling reality. So we saw a decline across all sectors, but that decline of uh, first time adult students was particularly large at community colleges and it actually corresponded with an increase of um, enrollment of first time adults at for profit institutions. Um, I would argue this is a troubling trend, uh, given that for profit institutions uh, tend to have worse educational and economic outcomes than do community colleges. So given this, as well as the fact that community colleges serve more than half of all undergraduate students from low income backgrounds, community college enrollment declines threaten to worsen educational inequity. The Center on Education and Labor at New America wanted to offset these declines. So to do so, we partnered with six colleges in three states over the course of 18 months. And based on that work, we published a playbook that contains recommendations for colleges nationwide on how to increase adult enrollment. This slide shows the bringing adults back to community college cohort. So over this period, we worked with two colleges in Oregon, that's Mount Hood Community College and Southwestern Oregon Community College two colleges in Illinois, that's Harry S. Truman College, which is one of the city colleges of Chicago, as well as Prairie State College. And then two colleges in Louisiana, that's Fletcher Technical Community College and Delgado Community College. So based on this work, uh, we came up with five themes and recommendations um, that we believe community colleges nationwide should implement in order to increase adult enrollment. So based on this field research um, and our learnings from this cohort, we believe that community colleges should one, improve their communications with adult students, two, revise their satisfactory academic progress or SAP policies, three, increase course flexibility, four, establish case management systems for enrollment and advising, and five, help students afford their basic needs. So I'm gonna go over each of these themes and recommendations in more detail throughout this PowerPoint, but I do wanna say, um, that we go into much more detail in the playbook itself. So um, for some questions, if you're thinking about how do I make this change on, on my college campus or um, you know, how can I get more specific, uh, please do look at the, at the playbook. There are a lot of really helpful resources there uh, to get you started. Uh, so to jump in with theme one, um, improve communication. So as part of this work, we conducted in-depth qualitative interviews uh, with current and stopped out adult students at each college in our cohort. Um, and I think that this uh, student quote from an adult student um, at a college in our cohort really summarizes a broader finding that we saw at community colleges um, in, in, in different parts of the country. So this adult student shared with us, with enrollment, advisors need to communicate better. I sat around in 2020. I was waiting on an advisor to let me know what classes I was supposed to register in. It was weeks I was waiting until they finally got back to me. I didn't know that I was supposed to enroll at the City Park campus, and I started at another campus. Because of this, I took classes that first year that I didn't need to take. Nobody's trying to take extra classes. That's like money that could have gone to something that you actually needed. So again, while this represents one adult student's experience, uh, we saw that there's a lot of truth in this statement that applies to community colleges more broadly. So to offset this, 
uh, we recommend um, four action items for community colleges nationwide. Um, the first is to create a messaging campaign on the specific financial benefits of career and technical education programs, or CTE, on your campus. Given that so many adults attend community college to increase their economic security and are attracted to career and technical education programs as a result, we think it's really vital that community colleges market and message the specific financial benefits of their CTE programs as a way to increase adult enrollment. Second, we recommend creating a central place on your website for returning adults with step-by-step re-enrollment instructions. Third, we recommend hiring enrollment navigators and commuting their, communicating their availability directly to students. And I'll come back to that enrollment navigator piece subsequently in this, in this presentation. And fourth, we recommend creating a set of incentives to entice students to re-enroll. Now, I wanna lift up a success story from one of the colleges in this cohort, um, and that's Mount Hood, uh, which is in the Metro Portland area. So throughout this project, uh, Mount Hood decided um, to incentivize students to return and re-enroll um, at campus to reduce outstanding student balances owed to the college in a way that would remove registration holds for hundreds of students on campus. So in doing this, they assisted 685 students, which led to a 285 student enrollment increase. And the college spent about $107,000 on reducing these outstanding student balances but because it led to this big increase in enrollment, it actually netted a $400,000 return on investment. So this just shows that uh, incentivizing students to re-enroll on campus can actually be a financially beneficial strategy for community colleges in the short, medium, and long run. Now, our second theme has to deal with SAP, or again, uh, satisfactory academic progress. And before I jump into this quote and recommendation, I just wanna provide a little bit of background on what SAP is to make sure um, everyone on the line um, is, is sort of aware of this issue. So to be eligible for federal financial aid authorized under Title IV of the Higher Education Act, college students need to make satisfactory academic progress, or SAP, and colleges must have a policy to define and monitor that, prog that progress. So while the specifics of what constitutes making SAP at colleges varies, generally, this means that uh, or, or, at lots of institutions, this means that students need to achieve a GPA of at least 2.0, and they must um, pass at least two thirds of the classes they are enrolled in. So this quote comes from an administrator at a college in our cohort that really lifts up the issues uh, with SAP. SAP is one of those hot button issues. Last semester alone, we've seen more SAP requests than ever before. Students are having other challenges, but it is affecting the SAP process. We saw in a student survey when you get into trouble with SAP and you start getting these emails that are using words like probation and threatening dismissal, that can compound issues. So while colleges are required to have a defined SAP policy and students must make SAP in, in order to be eligible for federal financial aid, there are things colleges can do um, to help students in, in this process. So we have three recommendations uh, relating to revising SAP that we think colleges, uh, community colleges nationwide should employ. So first, we recommend improving communications with students before and after they fail to make SAP. Second, we recommend creating a fair, well-documented and simplified appeals process. And third, we recommend all colleges analyze SAP patterns by race, gender, and Pell status to see if there are inequities on campus in terms of which students are failing to make SAP in any given term. I also want to lift up um, another success story from a college in this cohort, um, and this deals with Delgado in New Orleans um, and their ability to revise SAP. So during this project, Delgado re-examined their SAP appeals data, and they noticed that they had hundreds of students with incomplete SAP appeals. And the reason for all of these students was they had failed to submit third-party documentation to back up their appeals, uh, their appeal and the SAP process. And so this was an institutional choice. Delgado realized they, as a college, had required students to have this documentation requirement as a way to kind of bolster and back up their SAP appeal. Delgado changed that institutional policy, and as a result, they no longer have a single student with an incomplete SAP appeal. And so what this does, it, it allows hundreds of students to become eligible for federal financial aid, which opens up the doors for them to re-enroll at Delgado. 
Our third theme is on increasing course flexibility and has everything to do with the very many demands that adult students tend to face. Not only are they students, but they're often balancing caregiving and work responsibilities. And I think that this quote uh, from an adult student at a college in our cohort really speaks to why it's so critical for colleges to increase course flexibility. Taking virtual courses was awesome. I had a newborn, she was born right before the pandemic. So I went back in the fall of 2020 and it was all online. So I didn't have to do any shifting or anything. And I loved it. I wouldn't have gone to the class at all if it hadn't been online. So based on this, we offer three recommendations for colleges to increase course flexibility. The first is to offer more night and weekend courses. And we understand the staffing constraints uh, to this. And we go into that in more detail in the playbook. The second is to offer more high flex courses or courses that can be taken virtually or in person. And the third is to increase flexibility for entire programs rather than just one course at a time. And so taking a step back, this is really about crafting course schedules to meet adult students, uh, adult students demands um, so that adult students can take courses that work with all the things that they're trying to balance. Our fourth theme is about um, establishing case management for enrollment and advising and integrating enrollment and advising as a continuum of services. Um, I'll, I'll kind of come to what we mean by case management um, on the next slide. But first, I think this quote from an, a stopped out adult student in, at a college in our cohort uh, really illuminates this problem. There were too many emails that got me confused. I just want to talk to one person, like one person to ask all of my questions. I don't want to go through different offices. They say go to this one for financial aid, this one for health insurance. The pandemic made it hard and virtual made it not attractive. So to offset this problem, we recommend that colleges hire enrollment navigators to integrate enrollment and advising and establish a case management system to do so. Now this figure uh, directly from our playbook, I think really um, illustrates what we mean. So enrollment navigators are trained professionals whose job is to work with students throughout the application and enrollment process to help answer any questions they may have. Um, after enrollment navigators establish one-on-one -on -one relationships with students, they're in a really great position to introduce those students to a college navigator or more traditionally a college advisor once they actually start classes and re-enroll in campus. Now, those college navigators or those advisors um, in a case management system would work with the same students throughout their entire academic experience so that students have one person, one point person to go to with all of their questions. This works uh, or allows college navigators to learn a lot of, a lot of things about their students so that when um, applicable, they can refer uh, the, those students to benefits coordinators, which um, brings me right to our next recommendation. So our final theme is on uh, the need to help students afford basic needs and the need for community colleges to help address basic needs in security um, on, on their campuses. Um, I think this quote from a stopped out student at a college in our cohort really illuminates uh, the extent of the problem in terms of basic needs and security on community college campuses. Everything costs so much, and I'm at the point where now I can barely afford groceries and I can get public assistance and still can't afford groceries. I don't plan on living like that. It's not a goal of mine. My goal is to be financially stable where I can take care of my children without public assistance. So given the extent of basic needs and security on college campuses, um, we recommend four action items for community colleges nationwide. The first is to hire benefits navigators who are trained professionals uh, who coordinate basic needs support on campus and help students access available resources, both in terms of uh, community resources, as well as public benefits programs that those students might be eligible for. The second is to require student basic needs training for all faculty and staff to help build a campus-wide culture around the need to address basic needs and security. The third is to review institutional policies relating to basic needs and financial aid to see if there are any specific pain points that colleges can address to help um, not exacerbate this issue. And finally, um, offer students free resources. There are so many great examples of colleges stepping up and finding ways to offer students free food, free transportation vouchers, and free technology throughout this pandemic. And we think that for colleges to increase adult enrollment moving forward, it's critical that they maintain uh, these efforts.
So with that, um, I will pass it over to Iris Palmer, who will be moderating our panel discussion. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, really appreciate your outline of all the things we learned in this project. Um, and I also wanted to add a couple of thank yous to other people who were involved in this project. Um, so I wanna thank um, ECMC who helped fund the work and really provided a lot of the thought leadership in helping us design the project. And I also wanna thank Student Ready Strategies um, for their help in providing some of the uh, direct technical assistance to the six colleges uh, that we worked with. Um, and I also wanna thank our advisory committee. Um, so we have some wonderful uh, members of our advisory committee joining us for this um, panel here today. And there are a few who, who are not on this panel, but I wanna thank all of them for providing um, thought leadership and help and support, not only in designing the research, but also helping connect it to the field. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, it's just been an amazing project, and we're really excited for the results and what, what has come out of it. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel. Um, so we're joined today uh, by Te uh, Tess Henthorn, Senior Program Manager for the College Excellence Program, College Excellence Program at the Aspen Institute. Julia Lawton, Director of Program Administration at Achieving the Dream, and Michelle Wilson, Director uh, of Evaluation and Learning at the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. So welcome everyone. We really appreciate you joining us here today. Um, so to kick us off, I'd love to hear from each of you about why you think this work matters, why it's important for community colleges to focus on adult students, and why should community colleges nationwide be prioritizing enrollment services and student outreach? Um, we'll go ahead and start with Julia. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Um, we don't have a choice, I think, is, is the answer. Um, the average age of community college students is 27, 28. But the way that community colleges were designed, um, our structures, our processes, our culture, our policies were typically designed for the traditional 18 to 21 year old student who, you know, was a full time student, was able to be there on campus. That's the way we were we were designed as institutions. And this has resulted in us not um, being the best place for adult learners. And so adult learners take longer to complete their credentials. They stop out more frequently. They drop out more frequently. Um, and then they're more frequently less likely to get connected to their college at all. So um, it's something that we have to work on. Um, and it's something that we, we absolutely need to. At the same time, the K-12 pipeline of students is starting to decline in most, if not all, communities across the country. And so it's really both an imperative, not only for our mission as institutions, as community colleges, but it's also a financial reality for most of our institutions, for many of our institutions. And part of that is why Achieving the Dream partnered with Illumina Foundation and other national partners um, a couple of years ago to, to support 20 community colleges to focus on expanding access for adult learners to community colleges. And we have learned so much from that effort. So thank you so much for helping us cross-pollinate the learning from your colleges to our colleges and to help inform our playbook as well. Um, Michelle, I'd love to hear from you and your perspective about why this work is so important. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me to the table. It's been um, wonderful to see you guys move this work forward. Um, from our perspective at the National Fund, it's important because it really taps into an underutilized talent pipeline, right? So one of the key themes from our work in the Advancing Workforce Equity, um, uh, that initiative was about how much money was actually left on the table in communities as a result of um, inequitable, practices, inequitable practices, right? And so a large part of that um, has to do with looking at the workforce ecosystems of which community colleges play a role. And so the points that I um, wanna make in that is, so that is that finding ways to support adult learners, returning learners um, um, is critical um, 
to our work. So looking at equitable practices and access um, to community colleges. And I love what the playbook does in terms of like, in terms of improving communications, like you have some really targeted strategies that really um, work to, to, to address um, the talent pipeline, like increasing that talent pipeline. So it's good to see that, that work um, get launched into the field. I really appreciate that perspective, the sort of workforce equity perspective is one that is missing too often, I think, in these conversations. Conversation. So thank you so much for bringing it here today uh, in this in this particular panel. So Tess, I'd love to hear from you and your perspective on why this is such an important topic. Absolutely. Um, well, to echo Michelle and Julia, thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, and it's been so exciting to see kind of this playbook come to fruition because it's doing a lot of really important work. Um, and I think the thing I would add to Julia and Michelle's answers is just that this is kind of all happening in, in context and in conversation with enrollment declines and retention declines that are we're seeing across the country. Um, and so being able to get adults um, back on campus and enrolled as well as through college and you know achieving high and equitable rates of post-graduation success is going to help combat enrollment declines, but it's also helping to deliver on um, the promise that community colleges are kind of based around, which is to get folks jobs that are going to be sustaining themselves and their families and their communities. Um, so I think that this is all happening in a very timely moment as well. Yes, yeah, so the workforce pipeline connected to actually helping people have fulfilling lives and fulfilling careers. So drawing that line all the way through. So we sort of have a college perspective uh, workforce um, pipeline perspective and then like connecting it to the individual and what the individual wants from their education. Um, all really important points and I think it is very well said and also I think we agree with all of you and why this is so important. Um, so Julia, if we could jump back to you, um, we regularly hear from community colleges that they, they'd like to know who's doing this work well and how particularly how they fund it, I think, is a, is a big question we get a lot. Um, so they can bring those strategies to their campuses. Um, can you share some su successful examples that you've seen in your work of community colleges that have effectively and equitably managed this enrollment, particularly for adult learners? Sure. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I think the simplest thing is painfully obvious. Um, so your audience might groan a little but it's ask them. Um, adults in your community, not necessarily the people who are already enrolled in your college, um, but the adults that don't get connected to your institution. If you don't ask them why they're not getting connected, what they want, what their goals are, what their challenges are, um, you're not, you're going to run the risk of uh, leaning on assumptions. Um, and this is something we found out in the um, PACE grant, the grant that's focused on adult community college uh, enrollment, the colleges that started by asking their adult, learn their adult learners and their adults in their communities that aren't currently enrolled in um, any kind of program, they're the colleges that really uh, were able to, to move quickly and swiftly to address some of those issues. So as, as painfully obvious as that is, uh, I'm going to say it and, and say it clearly that ask adults in your community what they need, what their goals are. Um, another thing that is being proven by some of the grantees in, our, in this effort is that a strong community presence is essential to the successful um, adult learner enrollment strategy. For some colleges, this has meant um, hiring adult enrollment outreach coordinators. We have a wonderful event next month uh, where we're going to hear from three of those individuals who do this work about what that looks like for them. Um, but for others, this has also meant that uh, they're just, they're physically located um, in the communities that they're serving. So they've identified neighborhoods where perhaps they have had less interaction with um, historically, and they're really trying to be more intentional about how they're showing up for those communities. So there's there's different ways of doing that. Um, 
one of the colleges um, in Alabama, a rural college in Alabama, has got a partnership with a local judge. Um, and they go to the court um, frequently. And there's a back room that they go into where the college has kind of an enrollment process set up. Um, and they the judge in uh, shares information about the college with with individuals who are in the courtroom and encourages them to go and meet with the college personnel in the private room um, to learn more about uh, their programs and their different opportunities. So there's a lot of creativity in our colleges. There's a lot of these things happening that, you know, we need to be elevating and we need to be sharing because I think there's there's a lot of innovation happening and a lot of really good um, mental energy being spent on this problem. So I'm hoping that we can continue to share more examples of what this looks like and that uh, more of you who are listening also who have examples of what you're doing that you can also share and, and uh, connect with each other on this as well. Absolutely. We're always looking for good examples to share and particularly just going to put a pin in and re-emphasize uh, regularly speaking to your students and also the adults in your community that you want to enroll is so important. And not just the people that you see a lot or that are very engaged in your community, but the people who maybe are less connected uh, to your community. I think people um, that we have found are very surprised when they start to have those conversations about how they're actually interacting with the community and how the community perceives them. So really important points, Julia. Thank you so much for making them. And they're really important. Um, so Michelle, um, in your experience, what role does community college data play in this work? Um, and how should colleges be using it to re-enroll and support adult learners. Yeah. Michelle, I think your internet connection is a little bit unstable, so I'm going to come back to you, um, and hopefully we can get that sorted out. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and skip to you, Tess. Uh, so what are some of the largest challenges you've seen community colleges face when it comes to equitably serving and enrolling adult learners? So I think two challenges come to mind where the first is getting students onto campus. So thinking about messaging and recruitment, um, as well as enrolling students in credentials of value on their college campuses. Um, so the first challenge with recruitment and messaging to prospective students, um, really we've seen a challenge being able to have colleges kind of reach the, the individuals that are in their communities in a way that's honest and informative and kind of speaks to their experience and their needs. Um, at Aspen, we've done some substantive research on how to effectively kind of reach underrepresented populations in particular. And a lot of times from colleges, we've seen kind of language that is speaking to, you know, an 18 year old that has just graduated from high school. Um, and they are looking to, you know, enroll in a two or four year institution institution. I mean, it's not really speaking to, you know, a single mom who's balancing childcare and needs to enroll in night classes, but is excited to kind of pursue further education. So we see that adults are kind of coming with unique needs and motivations. Um, childcare, someone that needs a flexible course schedule because they have to maintain their job and enroll in school someone that even might have like a mistrust in higher education. There's someone that had enrolled before and dropped out um, or had folks kind of in their personal network that have had negative experiences um, that now kind of have, you know, colored how they view community colleges, even if that's not the institution that they had been enrolled in within their own community. Um, and so it's really a, kind of a question of communicating the value proposition um, around community college programs to these adult learners. Um, and I guess the, the last piece to kind of pull the thread from what you were asking Michelle about data and enrollment um, is that the data in messaging is uh, Chris was sharing earlier is so important. Um, when we did focus groups with prospective community college students, everyone was really, really savvy. Um, and we had folks, you know, looking at a message from their regional community college and saying like, 
this is great, but I'm sure they're not telling me, you know, how much books are going to cost or how much transportation is going to cost. You know, this isn't telling me what my actual odds are of getting in a job after graduation. Um, but kind of all of these different components that go into enrollment, but also to kind of buoying folks all the way through college into a good job. Um, and then just the, the second piece that I've seen a challenge around is kind of shifting enrollment um, from enrollment in any credential at colleges to enrollment and graduation in credentials of value, um, because we know that students are enrolling in college um, to get a good job and advance their career, whether that's directly after community college or through transfer and then into a job. Um, but we know that focusing kind of solely on increasing enrollment numbers doesn't actually help students complete um, or have strong rates of post-graduation success. So, so the enrollment number only does so much. Um, and I'd be happy to speak about that a little bit more, but we know that being able to deliver on value is helping colleges to make good on their promise to students. It's building a case in their community that they can help secure future enrollments and it's helping to improve equitable outcomes really important points about the data piece. Um, and welcome back, Michelle. I actually want to think that's actually a really good way to pivot to you to hear a little bit more about that, about how data should be used to do this well and equitably. Yes. And thank you, technology, for doing what you do. Uh, <clears throat> so I think, um, in my opinion, I think it's really important um, when we talk about data, there are four things that we know to be true um, is that um, data helps us identify barriers and it also and what's preventing adult learners from enrolling and I think that's what Tess was speaking to um, but it also um, um, is critical if, in using that data to be able to better respond to the needs of adult learners this is what Tess mentioned as well too and attract progress and so I'm going to state the obvious um, and it helps us to understand and measure our impact and all of that also, in, the, in addition to looking at um, the challenges, it also helps us to lift up what's working, which is what you guys did so beautifully in your examples um, in the playbook, right? But what I really want to point to when we start talking about um, community colleges and data is just, you know, we know that community colleges have access to a wide array of an amazing amount of data. So it goes beyond having the data, but how to use the data, right? So it's also, so, and in my experience in working with community colleges across the country, it's about um, gathering the right kinds of data to answer the right kinds of questions about what we need to know, right? And so, and it also speaks, um, uh, is critical in helping us determine who needs to be at the table, right? So we're talking about the work, the workforce ecosystem of which community colleges play a role. Similarly in community college systems, who needs to be at the table, right? And so one of the things that we've identified here when talk to students, talk to adult, learn, adult learners, it's right, like, so do we have we're having employers at the table, um, having um, students, learners at the table as well too, right? So we can ask the big questions where everybody can give their input is really um, um, critical. I'm, what I love about the playbook is that it pairs so nicely with the work that we're doing um, at the National Fund with community colleges, right? In our community college labs, right? Looking at the social determinants of work, looking at how to use data to improve industry partnerships, um, 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 looking at how to bring race equity, a race equity lens to credentialing programs. All of these things are really important. And just like, again, when you talk about the tools and resources that are available, um, being able to draw from all of these spaces, the work that's happening and achieving the dream, it's just really critical, but they all have a data component. So again, just to wrap that up, it goes beyond, um, having the data, but knowing how to use the data in a way that it um, can help student learners. <clears throat> Using the data is the hardest part. <laughs> having the analysis and the decision-making structures to be able to actually act on the data is definitely the most difficult piece, I think, of this. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Michelle. I'm going to pause and just say to the audience, please put in any questions you have for the panel or for me about the work more generally. Um, we're happy to answer those uh, as we go along. Um, I have a few more questions, but I'm really excited to entertain the questions from the audience as well. Um, so we've talked about a lot of different things that colleges should do to address adult learners and, and address their enrollment shortfalls and, and to make their structures work better. There's a lot here. 
Um, who would like to talk about how colleges should make the decision around where to start and how to start this conversation on campus or actually making policy and practice changes on their campus? It's I mean, a surprise question. So <laughs> go ahead. Well, I mean, obviously I'm gonna lean into the data piece, right? Because that's what tells your story, right? And so I think understanding, well, so there's, I think there are two parts of this, like understanding what does the data tell us about the challenge, the size and the scale of the challenge, and what are the drivers of that, right? So, I mean, I love Chris's, um, in his PowerPoint up top, he talks about the decline in enrollment and offered a couple of um, points of, wh of why that was critical and what was important to look at. Like, that's an important data point that we should dig into, right? And so, um, being able to tell your story with data for to me is a starting point for how you begin to address the problem, right? And I think that is both um, the quantitative data and the qualitative data, like what does the scale and the size and then the impact it has on the people in your community. <clears throat> That's where I would start. Julia, Beth, either you want to jump in? Agreed full, full heartedly with Michelle. Um, and I guess I would just expand that to say, so um, looking at the data for your institution, but it also feels like within your community and the partners in your community, um, when you ask the question, Iris, I was thinking even about employer partners. Um, mm -hmm. So to, to be able to look at the data to say like, are our students that we think are going on to get jobs at X employer in our region or transferring, are they actually doing that? And then going you know, on the path that we've set forth from them, but to, to expand the scope of the data to look beyond your college too, yeah. I think is key. Anything to add, Julia? I 100% co-sign on everything they just said. I, I have nothing more valuable to add. So start with your data. Start with your data in your community, qualitative and quantitative data. I think that's a really important point. It's not just about your student record system or about a general BLS survey of your area. You really need to talk to people. And that is a really important part of the data. Um, I, I want to just like drill in a little bit more on the enrollment piece, because mm -hmm. I think that um, a lot of colleges tend, or a lot of community colleges tend to just sort of receive who comes and not necessarily have the most directed um, enrollment approach. I'm wondering if anybody has um, recommendations for the colleges that might be on here or other policy organizations around like where colleges can um, work on the sort of enrollment funnel for lack of a better term like where do you think them like they should be focused on in um increasing their capacities around enrollment so i think that's a great question i mean i think the work that we're doing with lumina around advancing industry partnerships um with and with community colleges is looking at ways to increase enrollment around women of color right and um one of the strategies around that is like how do we even like how do what pockets of our work can we dig into that can help build that pipeline right and so so how do we use our industry partnerships our employer engagements how do we have conversations at that level that um, help shift policies and practices around certain sectors that um make enrollment for women, particularly women of color, people of color, um, more accessible, right? And so I think this is to Tessa's point about looking at the community and, and engaging employers in the conversation, I think is one of the ways. So i um, really excited about the work that's happening there. But I think that is just, that, I think that's one way um, of, of looking at it. I mean, I think so, that's what we're tackling right now. Michelle, we'll definitely try to include a link to that work um, yes. with the recording of the webinar, because I think that is a really important point. Um, and I want to open it up to Julia and Tess and say, like, are there any resources that you've been working on that you'd like to highlight for people in this conversation as well? Yeah, I think marketing is one of the major things. We're not good at shouting about what we're good at. And I, I think community colleges can do a better job there. 
I know funding is an issue. I'm not going to um, try and pretend it isn't. Um, that is that is a major issue. But there is also a return on investment for, for colleges that really do this well and can actually attract adult learners back. Uh, there is a significant potential return on investment um, if they can keep them and support them through their credential earning. Um, so it's it's both a challenge up front and something that can that can bring some rewards later. Um, improve our websites. <laughs> um, they're hard to navigate. Um, they're 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 a little challenging. Again, this goes back to finances, I know. Um, but but we could absolutely do a better job at, at funding uh, at at with our websites on, on marketing, what we do, what we can offer and how we can fit into adult learners' lives. The other piece is the partnerships are so critical, particularly for underserved communities, communities that we've neglected before. If we are not physically present there, we are not building the relationships that we need to be building that are gonna lead to enrollment. Enrollment for adult learners particularly is very relational. And if we are not going in and intentionally making those connections and, and showing the communities that we really care about them and that we have what they want and what they need to better their lives and better their families' lives, then we're not doing the work that we need to do for our adult learners. I really appreciate that, Julia, because I think this goes back to creating equitable practices, like equitable and accessible practices, right? It's it's understanding the needs of your community and being responsive to it. Um, I, I just appreciate that point. <laughs> I do as well. I'd love to hear you jump in here. I just wanted to speak to Julia's point about funding. Um, and the realities that kind of come with that as part of as part of um, making reforms at institutions and just to acknowledge that like that's a reality that everyone is working within, but it often requires making some really difficult decisions in order to be able to divert resources to other areas of the college that really are going to be able to help with enrollment. And the other thing on my mind is advising, which feels like mm -hmm. it kind of is coming hand in hand. Um, so recently, I know that um, we just had our big Aspen Prize ceremony, and we're sharing kind of about all of the, the finalists for the award. And I was really struck by um, Broward College implemented this program called Greater Impact Budgeting. Um, but part of that involved cutting their entire athletics department so that they could divert some of those financial resources to advising and marketing um, so that they could hire more advisors. And they did a lot of really intentional work to kind of help with the, the enrollment onboarding advising structures at their college. Um, and But that was a really difficult decision that I think also had other impacts in the community. So um, I don't know if there's a neat takeaway except for to, to acknowledge that it is difficult, but um, we're starting to see folks in the field take strides towards, towards um, those goals. And then um, to your question, though, about kind of other work or resources, I know that um, Aspen has recently done some research about thinking around enrollment um, and completion, particularly for STEM fields. Um, so what does excellent and equitable outcomes for STEM fields at community colleges look like? And so that's an area that I think we would also be happy to share some additional resources to after today. Really helpful test. Thank you. And the Broward example is a great one. They also, um, I believe, got rid of their on-campus child care center, which is like a really hard decision to make. Obviously, we talk about how important that is a lot for adult students, but also it was very expensive and not serving very many students. And they had to make really tough choices about transferring some of those resources to additional and more intensive advising and how that would affect more students, they believed. So one of those things you got to have the data and you have to make really tough choices sometimes because you do have limited resources. So I think it's an important example to, to sort of hold out there. So, so limited resources, but I also 
think it's important to be real about what it takes to support students, right? I mean, yeah. I know what one of the colleges that comes to mind to me is Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte, right? Their opportunity scholarship programs, like we recognize the realities of the students, what the students face, right? So we know that some of them may have to support their families. We know the transportation, like the realities of what it takes. And so taking that into consideration when you design programs is really critical um, as well too, right? <clears throat> Yeah, we talk about um, like continuing a lot of the basic needs supports that students that um, colleges provided during the pandemic, which is just so important and were incredibly um, impactful during that time period. But of course, they were meant, many of them were funded by the federal government um, through um, higher education emergency funding. And so it's like, how do you continue to do that? when you have to make these tough choices? Because yeah, transportation and the basic needs supports are so important. And who's going to pay for it. So right. it's like, a, it's a definitely a tough choice. And I want to just acknowledge that it's not easy because I think we, as like policy people tend to be like, do all the things for people, yeah. then that'll just fix everything. But of course, it's much more, much more challenging than that. Yeah. Um, and I just also want to acknowledge that capacity of staff at community colleges is limited. Um, many of these people are doing three or four jobs. And to be able to do like institutional reform is just like another job on top of that. <laughs> on top of their three existing jobs. So it can be really challenging to do. Um, and hopefully the resources that we provided make it slightly easier because that's where I'm going with that. Um, so our playbook looks at enrolling and re-enrolling adult students, um, but it focuses on enrollment strategies and how to serve students once they're on campus, which is a little bit what we've been talking about now. But I was hoping that you all could talk a little bit about the importance of focusing on serving students' needs uh, from an enrollment perspective. Like we can sort of focus on that um, outreach piece and like guiding people through the enrollment process, but why is it also important to make sure that people are well served once they uh, enroll in the community college so they actually complete their credential? Michelle? Yeah, so I think, so it goes beyond if you build it, they will come, right? It's just like, so once they come, how do you get them to stay? And again, I, for me, it's still about access in terms of um, making um, services readily available, right? A lot of colleges, like when you come into certain student services, it's like, if I have to go way across campus, and you mentioned this in terms of someone who was waiting for an advisor to respond or just having accessible, if I have to go way across campus to get to something, that might lessen my, you know, I might be less in, you know, inclined to do that if I don't know where it is, if I don't move around, on, if I can't move around campus, if I'm unfamiliar with campus or whatever, but if making st student services available, readily available. So if you go into a building, you like, I can go here for this type of service, I can go here for that type of services, right? So I think just um, thinking about the proximity of services um, is critical in developing um, and getting people to feel comfortable enough to, to that's one step in getting people comfortable and saying, okay, I can, in terms of getting them to stay, I think is what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's an important point to think about the design and the structure and where they're situated and whether or not they're available virtually and at night, weekend, like all the other things. All, all the things, right, sure. Yep. Yeah. Julia, did you want to jump in? I fully co-sign on everything Michelle just said. I. Part of why the, the way we talk about this work is that we aren't designed for adult learners is because we don't have those options. Because we assume that um, whether we're aware of it or not, we assume that students can be on campus from nine to five and physically there, physically present. And that's just not the way adults, um, that's just not gonna fit adult learner lives. And so if we're not thinking about evening hours, virtual hours, weekend programs, those kind of things, we're just, we're just not designed for adult learners. I also, I think I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Fair enough. I have, I have thoughts, um, but I'm gonna let Tess speak. Okay, go ahead Tess. 
Thank you. I think for me, it also comes back to what Michelle was speaking about a few moments ago, where it's really being able to make data informed changes um, that are meeting students where they are. Um, the, the example that comes to mind for me is Amarillo College, where they kind of saw real challenges with um, course scheduling. And they looked at college data that was showing most of their students who failed to complete a course usually struggled around the halfway point mm -hmm. of the semester. And so they ended up shifting to eight week terms and they improved their completion rates by like 12 percent um but they they looked really hard at the data and the students they were serving and the students they wanted to serve um and did a lot of difficult work to kind of meet those challenges head on um and make changes that have now had a large impact on students staying and students going all the way through Julia, did you want to jump back in and talk and add your last point or not so much? I, I, I've got new, new thoughts. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Given, given what Tess said, I, the eight week um, approach has, has been really popular with a lot of our colleges since um, I think Trident Technical College is one of the first colleges that started doing this back in 2013 ish. Um, and there's resources that Achieving the Dream has put out there um, that my colleague who worked at Trident put together um, about how to do this well. One of the things I love about Amarillo is they are willing to say what went wrong. And I really wish more of us could be honest about what we haven't done well and what we learned from that. Um, and that's part of there's one tangent that my brain has gone down right now um, after hearing Tess talk about Amarillo. One of the things they learned um, was going to, they, they piloted that and they, they, it wasn't the right strategy. They should have gone to scale immediately um, because it was so challenging for them to pilot it and then figure out how to scale it. And I, just love that they share that and and how open they are about talking about that kind of thing but no that was not my original point no I but as a researcher I, was... I too would really like people to be more open about what does not work um it's really really challenging to get people to share things that they feel failed and i think that that does a disservice to the rest of the community because we don't know what challenges to be looking for and what we fall into the same traps right right exactly um so go ahead Michelle. i think this is weird that this is a um, an important policy indicator or a leadership indicate um uh, point where we can make a shift right in, in terms of not penalizing folks for being transparent about their work but using it as a data point to improve what's working right what's not working right like because failures are data points and lessons like how do we improve unless we know what's going wrong so I just wanted to make that point so I join you Julia and the amen choir on that 100 <laughs> yeah so um to bring back up the funding piece again I think uh people who provide funds for these initiatives in different ways either be that the federal government be that state government be that colleges themselves be that fund uh philanthropy like thinking about how to structure your funding your funding so that if the work does not work, actually figuring out why and being able to disseminate that in and of itself and not necessarily punishing the people who, <laughs> who had the idea and tried to implement it in the first place. Uh, maybe it's a good idea, I don't know. Um, so with our last few minutes here, I'd love to hear some final thoughts from each of you, um, particularly about uh, your work and how it and how it intersects with this and um, any last things you want to make sure you leave colleges with around enrolling adults and supporting them through to completing their particular programs. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with Tess this time. Thanks, Iris. Um, I think I shared a little bit about this at the top of the call, but the thing that intersects the most um, in Aspen's current work is that we're really thinking about kind of 
post-graduation success and equity um, and really thinking about kind of credentials of value as it factors into enrollment. Um, and just because we know that, you know, many students are coming in lacking clarity of purpose about their programs of study, they're graduating with credentials maybe that are aligned to low wage work um, and are not, you know, sustaining themselves and their families. And you know, also we know that this is impacting students of color and low income students. Um, I don't want to say the most, but um, they're a large kind of portion of this and that they're less likely than others to even graduate. Um, much less being able to think about kind of graduating into what type of job. Um, so that's just something that's been on our minds is thinking about kind of uh, success and equity in terms of enrollment. Um, but been very excited to hear kind of other thoughts from folks on the panel today. Um, so maybe I'll turn it over to one of them, but thank you again. Thanks for being here, Tess. We really appreciate it. Uh, Michelle, you wanna go next? Sure. Um, so our work at the National Fund really is around centering race equity in all of our work, right? And so we work across the board. Obviously, we work with employers. Um, we look at how we activate employers um, for improved outcomes. We talk about um, who invests solutions and also equipping workers for success and systems change. So all those all of those threads are really critical to um, um, creating space. Um, for people to live the kind of lives that they want, right? So it's really important that, when, in, in that we lift up what's working around um, um, jobs and opportunities that create um, space for people to make livable wages, like a livable wage and have meaningful lives and not being tracked into one particular job because that's what's there, but it's because what people wanna do. And so um, the difference between um, being in a job because you want it to and what you have to do is like, really huge when you start thinking about um, having the kind of life that you want, right? And so um, creating equitable access to that is just um, um, important. And so when, again, looking at the playbook, um, how can you how just make those shifts, small shifts, sometimes they're small. I think, Iris, I remember when you first talked about what happened um, at the college with, with the SAP policy, I think I said to you like, oh, I've got chills because it's just like little tiny things can make big improvements. Um, and shift the trajectory for a whole swath of people. And so um, looking for that um, are, are the ways that we move um, equity forward, right? And so it's not always like the big sexy things that people like to think of, but sometimes it's like the tiny shifts. And so looking for those tiny shifts and we can all, we can all work for and adjust those kinds of things in our work. So that's what I have to share. Here, here, Michelle, I particularly like the idea that you don't need a giant investment to do a lot of this work. A lot of it is simply fixing the way you communicate with your students, like just making that more clear and concise and understanding how to re-engage with federal financial aid. Like those are things that anyone can do. You don't need a lot of money. Uh, you need time. So I will say that, but you don't necessarily need a lot of money. So Julia, go ahead. When we brief, I know we're coming up to the hour. Uh, I I think the one thing um, I have to plug an event that we have coming up focused on adult learners that I'd love you all to, to participate in, and I'll share that in the chat. Um, but I think the last, the thing that I would love to leave you with is having an open door to all learners does not automatically translate into access for everyone in your community. When we talk about access at Achieving the Dream, we're not just talking about access to your institution, we're talking about access to opportunity, to social mobility, to community vibrancy, to things you want in your life, not necessarily need, as, as you said, you distinguish between um, Michelle. Um, and so I want to make sure that, that as we think through how we do this work for adult learners, that we're making sure that we're not just assuming that an open door leads to access. I think that is a great note to end on. Um, an open door doesn't necessarily mean access. It doesn't mean access to something that's valuable. And so that's up to us to make sure that it does equal access to economic mobility, a good life, and what people want um, their lives to look like. So 
With that, I want to thank you all once again for joining us. I want to thank everyone who participated here today. I want to thank ECMC for funding the project, and I want to thank um, Student Ready Strategies for helping us implement it. Um, and with that, thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>